Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to Acts Reformed Church on another wonderful Sunday that we come together as a congregation to be able to worship our Lord. So we leave all things behind and we meditate on, on worshiping our Lord today. So I want to remind you to keep focused so that we can go ahead and honor our God the way he should be honored. I do want to remind you that uh, for those of you that are watching online, uh, we are live on Facebook through the uh, Christian Thought in Our World uh, Facebook page. And uh, if you have any questions here, uh, we're going to have a microphone, which Stan will make available to you. So that way, uh, not only uh, people here, but people uh, who are also watching and hearing will be able to uh, listen to the questions that are being given. So with that said, we're going to begin with the uh, study that we do on the Baptist uh, Catechism, Young's Baptist Catechism. We're on question 63. Who is the head of the church? And the answer is Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Now, unlike some of the uh, last uh, questions that we've had, uh, this, uh, there's actually quite a few verses to look at that the uh, Catechism actually has. So we're going to be looking at four of them, beginning with Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So if you follow along with me, it's on the screen for those of you who are here. Oh, we don't have it? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, it looks like uh, the person who's usually in charge uh, was not able to be here. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read that aloud. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am always, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the first thing that we see is the, the, uh, the fact that what authority does Jesus have over the church? All of it. He has all of it. And where? What is his jurisdiction? It's heaven and earth, brothers and sisters. So right away we see that he is indeed ahead because all authority has been given to him. Going forward, now we're going to look at uh, what would be called Scripture B in the Catechism, which is Ephesians 1.22, reading, And he put all things in subjugation under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. I don't think it gets any clearer there, right? Right here it clearly states, who is, what is he head over? All things, right? And uh, who uh, and by, by what authority? by the authority of God the Father, right? Continuing forward, now we look at uh, verse C in the Catechism. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. So there again, we have another text that is very clear about him being the head of the church. Uh, we have D now, verse D, which states, he is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now notice uh, one of the things that we know that, for instance, that where it says here, firstborn of the dead, we know that Jehovah's Witnesses take a different stand on that. And, uh, but in reality, if you notice the, the very, uh, we now have okay, great. We now on, on, the following, on the following sentence, it actually, it explains it. It actually explains it, like it says, so that he himself will have first place in everything. So, you know, you could look at that as a, as a form of commentary. So we see that uh, these, these texts actually clearly show us this. Now I have some questions that I've added myself to give a little further evidence of Christ being the head. And the second question is, what is the first way that we know that he is the head of the church? And that's because he proclaimed that he would build it. And that's why, we, so that would take us to Matthew 16, which we looked at last week when uh, Brother James uh, spoke on this text. So as we can see, there's, so much that we can be brought out in scripture. And in this particular case, uh, we're gonna be focusing on the fact that who built this church? Jesus, Jesus built the church, so it's his church, right? And this is a, so that's a very, very important thing because we have other, others that claim to be churches as well, right? We have the Latter-day Saints, we have the Roman Catholic Church, right? You even have uh, Islam in which you have the Prophet Muhammad claiming to be, you know, the final, the final of the prophets, but who is, but in, in terms of God's church, who truly is ahead? Jesus Christ, right? 
So we don't we don't need uh, uh, any any kind of replacement because the Son of God Himself is indeed the head of the church. Continuing on, we put uh, in actually question number three: Knowing Christ is ahead, how should we conduct ourselves? So this is speaking a little bit more on a on a, on a practical level. This question should have probably been more towards the end, but uh, if we look at Ephesians 4:15. It says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is ahead, into Christ. So one of the things that we see is by him being the head, we are also to emulate him from that perspective, right? He is our, our example, and he is what, uh, who we, whose character we should actually seek uh, to be as. And then the, the next one is, uh, Number four, which says, Jesus Christ is exclusively the only head of the church. No other religious leader can replace him. And this is uh, based on a statement that I found in 1 Corinthians 3.11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we see that indeed there's an exclusivity to Christ. I'm sorry, go ahead, Brother uh, Alan. Sorry, uh, so this goes back to... Mm -hmm. What would be the response by the Catholic Church to this uh, verse if, if this seems pretty clear? Uh, you know, that's that's a good question. I'm I'm not I'm not too sure because I know that they have the title, you know, the Vicar of Christ. So they, I well, one of the things that we do know is that the, uh, for instance, the apostles did represent Jesus Christ. So they probably believe that that. Well, I know that they believe in the preeminence of Peter, and it has to do because of the text in uh, Matthew 16. So I think that they would say that because he has a preeminence over the other apostles, he would be the one that would be the one voice that would, that would truly uh, uh, represent Christ. But the whole point that I'm trying to make with these texts is that if we look at the text, the texts are actually all pointing to who? They speak of Christ. But do you ever hear Peter being called the foundation or him being called the head? You never see that in the text. You know, it's always about Jesus Christ being the head. So that's the thing that we're seeing in these texts. That It's very, very clear. You know, one of the things that we see too is like, cause what I like about this particular text is when it talks about foundation, what do we usually think of as a foundation, especially when it comes to the Old Testament? A rock, right? And even in the text of Matthew 16, you know, and the whole thing with the, with the rock. But in the Old Testament, who was said to be the rock? When we read the Psalms, who's the rock? Jehovah, right? Or Yahweh, you know? He's the one who is the rock. And so it's interesting to see now that, you know, when we see uh, in the New Testament, who is being spoken as being the rock? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So that that's evidence, first of all, not only that he is ahead, but that also of his divinity. Because the very title, the very concept that is being given to Yahweh is now being given to Jesus Christ. Right? Or has always been given, because obviously if he existed as a, uh, in the form of a, of a son in the Trinity, then he, then he had that, that, uh, that title himself. Right? Because who is Yahweh? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Now continuing forward, I put a... I had put about him being exclusive, then I put, what is another way that we know this? And I have Colossians 1.16, because it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. I really like this particular phrase. All things were created through him and for who? For him. For him. So this is one of the ways that we see that it's not only that, you know, that he, he's been given this uh, position, but who was... All this that has been created, what was it created for? It was created for him. Go ahead, brother. Um, what, what do you do with, because some people don't know this. We know this, but a lot of people don't know this. Yes. In verses 16, 17, and 18 of Colossians, uh, where it says all things, uh, it actually, in the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation, the word other is, is in the text four different times in those three verses. Do you have any commentary on that? Well, the only thing I can say is that those are added in because they're not in the original manuscripts. So that we know that when it speaks of all things, it's actually speaking of all things, not all other things. So that when we look at Jesus Christ, he's actually, he is like God, right? In the, in the sense that, that uh, not like God in the sense that he's not God, but that, that he, just as God has a, a preeminent uh, a position, and obviously we would not say of him that all other things were created, right? We would say that all things were created. So... That shows actually, I think that this is actually doing the opposite. It actually shows his divinity. Because I believe that there's actually question, uh, it's actually questionable how that translation was done, right? The New World Translation? 
So, you know, so that's one of the things that, that we see in that situation. You know, so, but in the original Greek, you know, those words are not in there. So it's very clear that all things is referring to all things. You know what I mean? So that means that that shows that he is creator. So he's not only, you know, not only were these things made for him, but he created them. So that's one of the things that we're seeing. I mean, I, I was talking about the fact that he is the head because he created the church, but he didn't just create the church. What did he create? He created everything. So even the creation itself was created by Christ himself, right? You know? So uh, continuing forward, so kind of to finish off the idea, I have a quote from uh, Martin Luther on Christ being the head of the church, and it reads as follows. Luther, and I think, and this is very important because this is, and and is going to actually help you, uh, Brother Allen, to answer a little bit more because in the Reformation, this was actually the big issue. You know, what is the church? And who is the head of the church? You know, and what authority does the Pope and what authority did the uh, magistrates have? And I like what, 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 view, uh, what actually uh, Martin Luther points out here, which it says that Luther viewed the church as the spiritual body of Jesus Christ made up of believers. In fact, insisted Luther, if the Pope and his clergy are not believers, which is entirely possible, for Luther viewed the papacy as antichrist. You know, and we know that our confession actually uh, follows that same ideology, the 1689. We may not agree today with that particular aspect, but they, they did believe that at the time. It says, and they are not the church at all. In 1537, Luther wrote in the small called articles, for thank God today, a child seven years old knows what the church is, namely the holy believers and lambs who hear the voice of the shepherd. Right, it says part three of article uh, 12. It says elsewhere in, in his large catechism, because Luther had a smaller and a larger catechism, he wrote, I believe there is upon upon earth a, a little holy group and congregation of pure saints under one head, even Christ, called together by the Holy Ghost in one faith, one mind, and understanding with manifold gifts, yet agreeing in love without sex or schisms. And that's Article uh, 3. Now, that's kind of, an, this is an interesting statement here at the very end because when we think of Luther, what, what, what church did uh, Luther institute when we normally think of it? We think of the Lutheran church, right? But from his perspective, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to build a Lutheran church. He was trying to build a true church of God. So here, if you look, he's actually saying, he's actually calling out the Roman Catholics and saying that they're not believers. He's making a very, a very clear distinction because he's saying that they're not, they don't have the truth. They're not following the true gospel. So, and this actually can be said also of John Calvin. When John Calvin, you know, did uh, the Institutes of the Christian Religion and he was uh, developing uh, the, the belief system, he wasn't trying to create another church. They, they were just looking at the church as one. Now, with time, we know that things, of course, fracture, and we have uh, different groups that come around, such as us, right? That's why we call ourselves Reformed Baptists, because we have particular views. And so we identify ourselves in that particular way. But in reality, all of us who are believers are really one. Right, and it, it should be, uh, and it should be, as it says here, uh, of one mind, understanding, manifold gifts, yet agreeing in love, right, without sect or schism. But in reality, the reason why we have it is because we all have. Well, first of all, you know, we're inadequate in and of ourselves in our knowledge, right? And we also have our sinful proclivities. So sometimes, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, sometimes we speak uh, certain truths to people about the Bible. Is it always received, even though sometimes they don't have an answer? Not necessarily, and so that's one of the reasons why you end up having these different sexes. So go ahead, brother. My question is: Do you think it was the intention of Jesus to have so many different denominations? My answer would be yes, from the perspective that that's the way it's worked out. So if He's over all things and His will is being served, this is what has happened as a result of that. Now, you know, obviously the, the Catholic Church would argue against that. They would say that, 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 that he didn't. He wanted to have one group, and that's why for them, you know, they're the true church, and we should be under, under their umbrella. And the cults for that matter, too. Yes, that's true. But the problem that you have, the biggest problem, that's one of the biggest problems that I have with the Roman Catholic Church, which is that they claim to have this unity. But have you guys ever talked to people who claim to be Roman Catholics, and you begin to ask them what they believe? Do they really believe what their, first of all, what their pope believes? Or do they stand on everything that, he's, that he states? Or even what the church itself states? I mean, how many, uh, I mean, the, the church has been pretty strong on the issue of abortion, right? And yet, how many people have you met that are Roman Catholic and they're pro-abortion? 
So you see that it's not, it's a facade. So it's, it's a false claim because they're claiming to be one thing, but in reality, they don't live it out. So we, we may not have the, the kind of unity, for instance, uh, by name that they do, but if you take, for instance, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, you know, the different groups that, that we've had, even the, you know, the, the conservative uh, Anglican churches, we're all in agreement. We all believe in the same gospel. If someone comes in here and he's a Methodist and he's a true believer, would we deny him uh, the Lord's table? If he, no, because why? Because he has the same gospel that we do, right? Go ahead. You, you mentioned that a lot of us historic Catholics, you know, don't hold to the view of, uh, you know, the hierarchy. Do yeah. you believe that's because of the lack of emphasis on discipleship? No, I, I think it has to do with culture. Because what happens is that we live in a culture, particularly American culture, we're very much about, and this is something, for instance, that I would say there's a good thing to it, but there could be a negative factor to it, I came to see too, which is that we're very much about individualism, right? And about, you know, speaking your mind, having your own point of view. That's why we, for us, you know, freedom of speech is a very important thing. But the problem is that we get so caught up on the individualism that I think we begin to rely on what we think. We think it has to, it's so, so in, in, in essence, there's a lot of Christians who even though they, they don't realize it, it really becomes me and my Bible. So it's about what they, how they interpret the Bible. It's not about how the Bible should be interpreted. Um, go ahead, brother. Yeah, about uh, whether Jesus is sending somebody to not mention. There's a biblical concept that calls us to divide, not for the sake of dividing, but to divide because of the truth. And when we see even the Protestant Reformation, it's not that Luther said, you know what? I'm going to start a new movement here. No. It is means which God has used in order to separate truth from error. So even within evangelicalism right now, there are some churches that we would not become uh, partners with them, like go do ministry with them. Why? Because we would believe that they are in serious error. Right? So we separate not because we want to make a new denomination or what have you. We separate for the sake of truth. Yes. Go ahead, brother. But I would add, on the other hand, God, God is the final judge. And in John 10, 16, he says, And I have other sheep that are not of this world. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Correct. Yes. They are the true believers. Because some people get into these things that they don't even know what they what their hierarchy believes, you know. Yes. Um, because it goes back to what I said. Wanna, they want to worship God. Yes. Yeah, and, and some people and the problem is that you know some people don't care. So for instance, for me, one of the things that's that's been been very important is looking at history. And what I mean by history, not just history in general, but Christian history. If you notice, we as a, as, a, as a people, as a Christian people, don't really pay attention to history. And I think that that's actually, our Christian history is very important. That's why we, 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 t we pay attention to the things like the creeds, because these are things that are actually setting down the beliefs that have been uh, coming down. You know, so we have, so, you know, a lot of times we talk about, about uh, tradition with the, with the Catholic Church, and we say, you know, we're not, we're not basing ourselves on tradition, we're basing ourselves on, on the Word of God. And that is true, but we do have traditions. Because if you look at, for instance, the perspective of the Reformed Baptist, is it not a tradition? Yes. You know, even if you're, even if you're, even if you're Calvary Chapel, that's a tradition. All these things are, are, are traditions. Another thing I want to point out is I want you, I want you to look at uh, how Jesus dealt with this situation. When Jesus came, did he come and only, for instance, acknowledge the Pharisees as, a, as religious people? No, he also uh, was, was uh, addressing other people. He addressed the, uh, the Sadducees, the scribes, right? So there were, because there were different groups, there were different Jewish groups, and he didn't just look at one group and say, oh, this is the group that, uh, that had it right, and we have to listen to them. Because even in, 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 in within Judaism, there were various groups, you know, and sects that had, that had happened. And, you know, we also have a, another group called the Essenes, which is not really mentioned in the scriptures, but, I mean, if you look at the Essenes, I think they were even much closer to the uh, biblical doctrines that we have than the other groups were. So it's kind of, you know, interesting, because Jesus must have, address some people who probably were scenes. Hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, Roman Catholics usually blame the multiplication of denominations due to the thousands. I think the most recent number I heard was like 40,000. I don't really believe, I think they were growing in faith, but 
Yes. They usually blame that on the principle of Solus Victoria. Um, do you think that there's anything that is contributed to that that would be political? I mean, and what I mean by that is that after the Reformation and the formation of state churches, and then after that, you know, especially with the American Revolution, uh, you have the, the, the concept of the separation of church and state. So if, if you look in the early church, let's say the second century, third century, when the, the office of the Bishop of Rome, before it, it, uh, it becomes more solidified as this office that, that, that increases in power over time, and if the early church would have had this concept of the separation of church and state, do you think that that would have resulted in the creation of a number of denominations had they lived under that kind of a cultural or political environment? So I'm, so I'm trying to understand your, your question. So you're trying to say, if that principle that we live with today was around back then, if that, if that would still happen? Well, would you, because remember, the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and the yes. Eastern and the Mormons, uh, they would say that the reason why you have all these denominations is because of Sola Scriptura. Okay. And, I, and I'm saying that what about the political environment that allows for someone to just say, hey, I'm going to start my own church. Okay. If you lived in the second century, you yeah. can just say, I'm going to start my own church, and I'm going to get uh, tax-exempt status and stuff like that. Right. That's something that, that, in other words, back then, it was like if you were part of the empire, you had to be part of this. Yes. So, and then eventually, during the Reformation, you have state churches, so now you have the church in the, the Lutheran church in Germany, or the church yes. in Geneva, or the church in England, or whatever, uh, with King Henry VIII. Uh, if, and after the, after the American Revolution, where the United States was this country, and, and you have the development of the concept of the separation of church and state, where the state cannot interfere with the affairs of individuals who decide to, to start a church and, and worship according to their own conscience. If the early church would have had the concept of the separation of church and state, where they do not have to be, if I live in, you know, let's say Athens, yeah. I do not have to go to the church of Athens, I can start my own church. If they would have had that political environment, do you think that they would have had a multiplicity of denominations back then? Oh yeah, absolutely, I think so, because then people are, are going to use it as, as basically as a key to be able to start your, your own movement, and that's essentially what's happened here in our modern day, right? And, but it's also an unfair uh, assessment because not all, they consider anybody that's not a Roman, like in the case of Roman Catholics, anything that's outside of Roman Catholicism, they consider it uh, to be a Protestant, right? So they're, they're basically putting everything on, on, the, on the Reformation, on the Protestant Reformation with all these different groups. But some of these different groups, like let's, let's take for instance, like you just mentioned, the, the, the Mormons. I don't know if we can say the same thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're they're not based on sola scriptura. They have authorities, so so it's an unfair assessment to say that. So they're adding all these different groups and putting them into into uh, lumping them with us who are actually not practicing a sola scriptura because they have their own authorities and they follow their own gospel and their own their own religious uh, practices and views based on their authorities, not on the uh, not necessarily on the Bible. So we, we have a disagreement within uh, evangelical denominations. So, for example, we would have disagreements with Calvary Chapel or mm -hmm. with the Lutheran Church or the Anglican Church. Uh, but we also have our disagreements with the Roman Catholic Church. What is it that identifies, let's just take Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel, and we say we have our disagreements with Calvary Chapel, but they're our brothers in Christ. But we won't say that about the Roman Catholic Church. What is it that binds us to Calvary Chapel? or other evangelical denominations, but separates us from Rome? I think, for me, I think it's an issue of soteriology. Because if you look at the Catholic Church, don't we agree on the same God? We believe, as a matter of fact, there's a little controversy that's going on right now between kind of like the Presbyterian and uh, Reformed Baptist groups, where they're trying, uh, there was a particular teacher, I'm not going to name him, but, you know, he came out and basically said, you know, I, I'm seeing that the Roman Catholics actually have a better concept of what God does than the Protestants do. You should name them. Um, I would say Paul names names. There's okay. nothing wrong with any as long as you're not slander. Yes. yes. Well, maybe you can refresh his name for me. <laughs> Craig Carter? Was it? Was it? Um, 
Well, you know what? No, or I think it might. I think it was somebody else. No, it was a. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, Carl Truman. Yeah, Carl Truman was the individual. And um, but to me, yeah, I found it very interesting that he was willing to say, "I'm more willing to side with these guys because of the concept of God." When what separated the Reformation, in my opinion, from the Catholic Church was really soteriology, because because what happens is that it has to do with how we're saved, right? At the end of the day, in the Roman Catholic Church, even though they claim that it's under grace, right? Which, by the way, the Mormons do this as well. There, they claim there is still a, a works-based salvation. You got to earn your way, you know, to you got to earn your salvation. Whereas what we're saying is that it's a gift of God. And so, like, so when you were mentioning, for instance, Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel is in agreement with us. They believe that, that, that you're saved by the grace of God through faith. And so it's those uh, particular groups that we align ourselves with because we are sharing the true gospel. So I would say, in theory, uh -huh. right, once you start getting down to the weeds, like you've got to do something to keep your salvation. If you, if you fall out of that, then you'll lose it. Oh, so that's well, when things get pretty fishy. Yeah, well, that, but that goes back to the, the old argument that we had with the, with the Catholic Church, which is you know, the whole issue of James 2 which is what is the nature of the faith, right? Is the faith that we have just a passive faith or is it a faith that works, right? And so I think, uh, I don't remember if it was uh, Luther or Calvin who said, the faith that we have is not a faith that is a faith alone. In other, in other words, the, our salvation is based by faith alone, right? Our trust in the work of God, but it's, it has to be a working faith. Why? Because Jesus himself, he gave parables, right? What did he say about, about a tree that did not bear fruit? Or that was that yeah that didn't that didn't bear fruit. It says that it should be cut and burned, right? So it's going to be the same thing with us. If we're not showing fruit, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be cut off. We're going to be and we're going to and we're going to be thrown in the fire, you know. So so it has to be an active an active faith. So like and you know we do have a statement which uh, Roman Catholics love to use. I don't remember the the citation of scripture where it says you know work out yourself in your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Yeah, but but I always like to say I have that in the sermon today. Yes, but I always like to point out you guys always quote that, but you never go to the next part, which is that it is you know God, you know Christ, you know working in you, the yeah to will and to do, you know, and that's that's a very important factor. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Johnny, and then uh, Alan's going to have a question. Sure. So I'm going to ask you a question, and we uh -huh. should do it another time because I know we're short on time. Since Johnny brought up the idea of separation of church and state, I I propose that in the future we can maybe. At Sunday school, the concept of theonomy, which has been brought up uh, quite quite a bit, and uh, but I don't want to elaborate right now. But sure. Maybe you guys can well, prepare something. Uh, just in general, my like my general opinion is that church and state is thrown out by the liberals and the seculars to tell us they don't care about the liberal Christians. They're fine with them. To tell us, keep your church within your four walls, right? And it's actually supposed to be the other way around, is that the state, and this includes state mm -hmm. officials, the state has no jurisdiction to tell the church what to do. That's how it would be more properly applied, right? Where they want to say, no, the state will tell you what to do, and whatever you do, keep it within your four walls. So it's turned on its head, basically. And the context of the, and, the, and that comes from the context of a letter that was uh, given by a Baptist congregation to Thomas Jefferson because they were putting that in in the Constitution. And what their concern was is that the fact that they were putting that in almost gave the implication that the state had a say over it. And what they were trying to say yeah, is- They were trying to get away from that. Yeah, they were trying to say, you know, that doesn't, that's, that's not gonna work because we, got, what what does the state have to do with the church? Protestantism fled from England because- Right, the, yeah. The state but Jefferson, but Jefferson clarified, he said it was to protect the church. It was not to protect the state, it yeah. was to protect the church. So that's very, very important that, that we keep that in mind. Also, mm -hmm. also, Go ahead, brother. Real quick, that, yes. that the letter also referred not to separation of gods and state. It was to deal with there is no state church. Yeah, it was for yes. the church. There was the okay. church. It, wasn't, yes. it really had nothing to do yeah. with separating God from state. It was a restriction got it. Yes. on the state, right. not a yes. restriction on the church. Misused. Not only is it not part of the Constitution in the bigger picture, because yes. it's a letter yes. by Thomas Jefferson, and it's also the principle of separation of church and state and separation of church from state. Yes. Right, and so it gets into whole thing. So it's a two-way thing. It's twisted to the point where we're at where if you mention the two together, yes. it's like anathema, right? Because you're not yes. supposed to do that, where yes. technically it has nothing to do with that. Yeah, and then I'm very, I want to very quickly take that because I have something that I need to do after this, but I'm sorry, go ahead. 
and then I'll take your or okay go ahead Yeah, well, what happens is that, see, this is, this is one of the points that I was going to point out is that, that I really like that, that uh, Martin Luther pointed out is that the nature of the church is really spiritual. Its true essence is spiritual. The true church is spiritual. That's why when Brother Brad was mentioning about when it mentions the one flock and the one head, it's speaking spiritually. Because obviously here on earth, what do men do? We create schisms. We separate ourselves. But in the eyes of God, we're one people. And that's the way that he's dealing with us, you know? But um, yeah, but the problem with the Catholic Church is because they don't base themselves on Scripture, then they have all these other traditions and practices that are unbiblical. And that's why, you know, so, so there's many reasons. I mean, look, another thing is look at the way they treat Mary. The prayers to the saints and Mary, I mean, that's that in itself. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a, uh, I mean, we, they say that it's not, you know, idol worship, but, you know, but it is. It really is because, first of all, why would you pray to Mary? We pray to, why do we pray to God? Because he's our savior. He's our maker and he's our savior. Did Mary save us? Mary didn't save us. And I've heard people say, oh, you know, um, and actually, I know I've mentioned this to Alan. There's people who tell me, well, you know, you need a, like a mediator. Like she's closer to God. So, you know, if you, if you give her your prayer, she, you know, God will listen. Right. And, and I always tell them, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because the Bible says that when it spoke of, of actually the patriarchs, that it says that they were a friend of God. If you have a friend, do you go through their mother? No. So if God is your friend, why would you go through your mother? You, you have access directly to speak to God. So why would you do that? But because they follow these human principles, that's why, you know, they do these things. Yeah. Absolutely. Because he is a priest. Actually, we really have only one priest. There's really only one priest, and that's a, a Christ. Christ is a true priest, like you said. Yes. The, the issue here, of course, is that the Roman Catholic Church believes that there is a sacerdotal priesthood that offers a sacrifice. Uh, it, it, the, the sacrifice of Calvary keeps getting repeated over and over again in the Mass. Yes. So when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, they believe that Jesus is instituting a priesthood. This is something that we deny as Protestants. The Reformed Reformation denies that there is a sacerdotal priesthood. We believe in the spiritual priesthood of all believers, but we don't right. believe in the sacerdotal priesthood. Yeah. I did want to make one brief comment. Uh, David Barton had pointed out that Thomas Jefferson, e even though he's the one that wrote the phrase separation of church and state, you know, he, and, and it, was, it was in reference to protecting the church from interference from the state, he actually used to have church services in the Congress. That's something that they're not, they don't tell you in the school. Yes. Uh, do I have time for one question? Last question? Sure. Yeah, because we want to give enough time for people to uh, do their thing yeah, in between uh, the services. Mm -hmm. on to his question, uh, and this is the issue of the the visible and invisible church. And okay. within the context of people making claims that, well, Christians they have a bunch of hypocrites. Like I know Christians that are out there, you know, and they're doing this and that, or you know, just all kinds of sins, and yet they call themselves Christian. Uh, what would be the connection here between the visible and invisible church? Well, the visible church is obviously made up of people who confess, right? But is every confession true? Does, doesn't the Bible mention that there are false brethren? Yes. Then we know that not everybody who's in the church is real. Furthermore, you know, we also have the fact that Jesus mentioned to us that uh, how, what way is the, uh, the way to salvation? It's narrow, right? Broad is what? The, the way to destruction. So I'll give you an example. When you have 70 million Americans saying that they're Christians, you think that these are all people that are going to be going to heaven? No, it's a, it's a much narrower group. But that's why I even like the way uh, Luther put it, where he put it here, uh, uh, that there is upon the earth a little holy group because it's really a remnant. It's a remnant of those people that are true. It was the same thing with Israel. When you have the nation of Israel, you're supposed to have a whole nation, a group of people that were supposed to be a godly people worshiping God. And yet, who were the ones that you know received the grace and received the salvation? Only the remnant, right? So it's the same thing within the church. Not everybody who claims to be a... So when we talk about the invisible and the, the visible and, and, and invisible church, the invisible church is made up of those that are the true, the truly called, the true faithful. And those that are just, you know, coming to church and doing their thing, that would be the visible church. You know, so... Next two questions. 
Yes, and that's actually going to be coming up, right, on 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 uh, on the next uh, on the next uh, catechism uh, lessons. So we'll have a better discussion of that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close it up now, if you guys don't mind. Already, let's go ahead and turn to our Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us Christ as head, for He indeed is the perfect one, who can indeed run things as it should, because He is the very God who created us, and all things were created for Him. I pray that in light of these things that we would live our lives so in that way, Father, knowing that we are belonging to our Lord Jesus Christ and that we are actually to emulate him because this is the reason why you sent your son, not only to save us, but to bring us the way of righteousness. So I pray that that way of righteousness may be made manifest in our sanctification and that we would glorify you, Lord, as you ought to be glorified and that you would help us from not only our flesh, but from the devil and his minions that are working against us, and that you would send your host of holy angels to also help us in this spiritual battle, Lord, that we would be prepared, Lord, to be able to take on our sin and the evils of the world, knowing that our God indeed has our back, as they say, and that he will protect us and that he will guide us through all things. So in light of that, Lord, we honor you and ask you in your precious and holy name that you may be uh, glorified in all things that we do. For we thank you for all in your precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Check two, one, go see, check.